Good morning, everybody. I hope that you survived the slightly shorter and maybe slightly cooler night last night. And um, also, I understand that some of you were kept awake by the generator, so <laughs> sorry to hear this, but thank you for your patience and forgiveness that things go wrong sometimes. But at least we do have generators, which is a very wonderful thing. So, today, I would like to talk a little bit more about how meta practice can help us to access those deeper states of meditation and a little bit more about the method that we're doing here, um, the context, the reason that we do it and how it can help on the in the practice and any other kind of technical points that might be helpful for you. And of course you can ask about this in the evening if anything's unclear or um, anything else comes up during the practice because you know, method is one thing, technique is one thing, the human mind is something very different. And we can't, you know, expect the mind to stay within the confines of systems. <laughs> so we have to find this balance between learning how to um, make use of the techniques and the methods that are offered in a way that supports our mental development, but doesn't in, kind of confine it in any way or become restrictive. It actually allows a kind of container in which it might be easier to direct the mind in certain ways and to rouse certain emotions and moods. But the container is not the actual practice itself. The practice is what develops in the heart. So it's this blend of method and intuition. And the emotional intuition is very important in metta practice. And in samadhi practice in general, it's a process of getting familiar with quite powerful, wholesome states. Somebody said yesterday that, um, you know, when they even have thoughts of may I be happy, it brings up an anxiety. Other people say it's difficult to trust uh, the pleasure even in its early stages because it's something we're not quite used to. We're used to driving a more kind of reckless car, <clears throat> maybe, um, you know, navigating states that are quite gross, quite coarse, quite easy to identify in a way. And here we're going into the subtler realms of the mind, which are a lot less clearly defined perhaps, a little bit more unfamiliar to us, and sometimes that can be challenging. And I remember being on retreat with Ajahn Ram um, one time in Perth several years ago, and I happened to, for some reason, PT started arising quite intensely. And um, this is kind of the rapture that comes through meditation that uh, can be really quite strong at times. And it was coming repeatedly for several days. Um, and, you know, even for me, even though I know this is a, a sign of the practice just developing, I thought, oh, isn't this a bit too much? <laughs> you know, kind of like, it's, it's a bit almost agitating for the mind after a while because it's quite intense. And uh, I went to the Dhamma talk that evening, and in the talk, he was talking about. Um, embracing and, and staying with difficult sensations and then he changed it around and he said sometimes you have to endure the bliss and I just got kind of goosebumps you know because it was straight to my heart it's like oh endure the bliss like wow I've got to get familiar and comfortable even with this more powerful emotions of the mind which we think of as pleasant we think we want them but when they actually arise it can be challenging because we don't yet know quite how to handle it it's Ajahn Brown's simile, which is kind of very male, <laughs> I don't know, not all males like fast cars, but he said it's like going from kind of driving, I don't know, what's the not very cool car here, a beetle? I like beetles. Not elder beetles, but you know, beetle cars, <laughs> like, or whatever, to driving a Ferrari. And, you know, it's a bit out of control at first. And maybe you use a touch that's just too coarse for that car, you only need a very light touch. I'm completely making this up because I've never driven. But... Um, <laughs> But it's like that with the mind, these are subtler realms and we need to learn to handle them with care. So, so far we've looked at metta as um, loosely defined as loving kindness, a kind of benevolent friendliness that can expand to include all beings. In fact, it's that unconditionality, that inclusivity, impartiality, boundless nature that really defines loving kindness as an exalted state of mind, as one of the Brahma Viharas. Um, but obviously there are steps to take to, um, to get to this point, and we started off by developing an attitude, a loving disposition, 
if you like, or a certain lens through which we can look at the whole of life, the whole of our experience. And I call that kindfulness, which is a, a combination of kindness from the right attitudes, right intentions that the Buddha taught in the Eightfold Path, and the mindfulness, which actually always should go together, because these intentions precede mindfulness in the Eightfold Path. So it means we're already um, learning to align our motivations, our intentions, our disposition, if you like, our way of relating to the world with loving kindness, with a sense of letting go, giving, non-control, renunciation, all different terms for renunciation, nekama sankapa, and also the non-violence, the gentleness, non-cruelty, patience, yeah? And this is something we can practice at any time. You might not always, you might not even be wise to always be cultivating metta, because that is, it can be quite tiring, especially in the beginning, if you're continually, you know, applying the phrases, it can take a bit of energy and you might want to do that only at certain times of the day or only when your mind is kind of receptive to it. You know, if you're dealing with other emotions or whatever it might be, it might be trauma from the past that arises in a, in a retreat space like this, which is very natural because these things almost emerge in order to be healed. Then at that time you can practice this basic body awareness with kindfulness or awareness of that emotion and see just how gentle you need to be. You know, sometimes we want to get close to these things, we've got the energy, we've got the courage, and other times we just want to make our attention much wider, more diffuse, and allow it to be held in a much wider, open space. <clears throat> so this matter of love and what it is has been really a question that humanity always has at the centre of their inquiry in life. It's uh, the subject of so much philosophy, and yet no one really knows what it is. And I think, really, one of the best ways to understand that is to actually develop it in the way that the Buddha described and find out, you know, how love feels and what its qualities are, what, it, what its obstacles are, and uh, how we can overcome um, anger, greed and fear, and all those unwholesome, or let's say afflictive qualities of the mind that cause us to suffer. And as some of you noted yesterday, it can be challenging to start with ourselves. I think that was the basic gist, or there was a question as to why we do. And um, yeah, in a way, we are a loved one to ourselves. I mean, consider why you came on this retreat. Probably for your own well-being, right? Probably not because you wanted to punish yourself by being in silence and wearing masks and you know, not having any choice about the food. You did it because you have your own well-being in mind, and in this case, your spiritual progress. Even little things like going to your room, keeping it tidy. I notice that when I start to practice metta, I start to take care more about how I leave things and my environment, and just that tender attention uh, seems to increase. You know, most likely you want to make sure that you're comfortable, that you're the right temperature. If you're cold, you put on more clothes. These are signs of taking care of yourself the way perhaps a parent would or someone who loves you. And this can be a way in to understanding uh, or connecting with our genuine wish for our own well-being. You know, regarding ourselves through the eyes of someone who really does love us. And noticing how the way we behave towards ourselves is actually sometimes very similar. You know, and if we can't do that at the mental level, we can imagine, we can remember what a person close to us or even a spiritual teacher, how they might see us, you know, how your fellow yogis would see you as really courageous, sincere practitioners on this path. So we can get in touch with a sense of our own goodness in that way. Another thing that's helped me quite spontaneously actually is having a chronic disease and being sick. Because somehow, when we're sick, we have an opportunity to send loving kindness to our body. Yeah, And I remember one time, um, actually it's a bigger story because it also got me in touch with my own mortality. I had a melanoma on my arm, which was always a funny shaped mole. It became my little ghost because it kind of had like wings and a head and anyway, and two black eyes. <laughs> <laughs> like a ghost, but anyway. 
One of my very old friends came to visit me and she looked at it. She said, I don't remember something like that on your arm. She's very um, direct. <laughs> and uh, I realised, yeah, it does look a bit bigger. It does look a bit strange. And then it started to bleed. I thought, oh, oh. And I kind of knew this is not good. So I went to the doctor's, some skin clinic. And they said, yeah, we're pretty sure this is a melanoma. And then I had a weekend to myself to kind of wait and see what treatment could be done, whether they could take it off. And while I was waiting, I was seeing it change, like, in front of my eyes. I thought, wow, this is kind of scary when you actually see it moving. So I slapped on all this turmeric. <laughs> I studied Indian medicine, slapped on all this turmeric. But the interesting part was that I would alternate between a kind of visceral fear that would come out of the blue, because most of the time I'm just carrying on my life, right? But in the deep subconscious, there's this reminder that you just don't know. You know, you don't know if this thing is like just starting to grow or it's already in stage four or whatever, because apparently it can go from one to four in like, or zero to four in like six weeks. And this thing had been there for like years, right? And started to grow for at least a year. <laughs> so I didn't know. But the interesting part was that this fear would kind of come through my body like, like kind of very delicate tremors, but really, ooh, suddenly. And then in between that also, I'd get this kind of overwhelming sense of love. It would just arise in me. And I related that to having a bigger perspective on life, my life, the preciousness, the value of it, that was informed by my fragility at that time. And we always are fragile, but Sometimes, the mess it's in our face, we don't really understand that. And it was just really interesting to me to see how much love was available, almost alternating with the fear. And I'm sure there were times that I was just going about my business and, you know, checking out which place I could go to to have it removed as soon as I could. You know, it's not that um, you leave difficult things in place. You take the, um, you know, the right measures to make sure that you're, you're going to be as well as you can as far as you can. Um, but it just gave me the sense of the value of my life and it helped me to relate to what I was doing, which is very challenging at times and nothing like the kind of meditative, simple life I went forth for. <laughs> A lot of it is admin. I'm literally online most of the day, like sometimes 14 hours, and in between mm. meeting the guests, the visitors, just constantly uh, organising people and, and things. <laughs> <laughs> the running of the charity, etc. But at this time, all of that faded into insignificance because I realized that my whole life, in a way, was an act of love, an act of gratitude to the teachers that have helped me on the path, um, and a way that I feel can bring some meaning into the world, something that you know, really is aligned with my deeper values, my ethical values. And suddenly the preciousness of life became very clear. And also just that sense of love for people, whoever they were, because I guess seeing through those eyes of, you know, being in touch with my own mortality, I could see other people's uh, fragility, you know, that we are just, we don't know what's going to happen to us at any given time. So sometimes this is also a way to um, generate metta, and um, it's a part of letting go, you know, let metta, love. It's something that frees, it's something that's very similar to the Buddha's third noble truth. You know, he talked about the cause of suffering being craving, but he talked about the end of that um, suffering being letting go of craving. Letting go means freeing. And the words he used were chaga, which means literally giving or generosity. Patinisaga, which means like relinquishing or throwing things away. Not in a negative way, but just letting the things that encumber us drop away, letting burdens subside and getting in touch with what's really, really important in life. I'm just going through these quickly, but Chaga Patinisaga Mutti literally means freeing ourselves. So freeing ourselves as we free others through the practice of metta from our own demands and expectations that are so unrealistic that we burden ourselves with, right? I don't know, but I hold myself to higher standards than I'd hold anybody else. I'm sure no one would be my friend if I held them to the same standards. And part of um, 
training with Ajahn Ram that's so beautiful for me is that he makes me be, um, he gives permission and encourages you to be a bit goofy. <laughs> so if you think I'm a bit goofy sometimes, that's part of it. <laughs> it's just, especially in a role like I have, you know, where you're kind of supposed to know a lot about the Dhamma and you're in a position of, you know, sharing what you know with others in a way that's hopefully going to be helpful. There can be a lot of projection, a lot of expectation and idealization. And if I take any of that on, or if I start to take on the praise and the messages of your teachings are like this and that, it's the Buddha's teachings and it's what I've learned, then it's a very dangerous place to be, you know. And it's important, I think, for anyone who's in a public, in the public eye. Um, sometimes I don't have much of a private life at all. Here it's great because I get a nice area that I can close the door and be by myself for <laughs> part of the day. Um, but it can be very challenging. And I think, you know, we need to be ourselves, whatever that means, but uh, behave in ways that don't take ourselves too seriously and don't buy into this idea of being kind of somehow different or special in any way, or even marginalised, right? Because I can definitely get into the bit on... I'm marginalised. I mean, there are no other bikunis, no one in my position that I can talk to in the whole country. So I am marginalised, okay. But if I make that an identity, then again I lose the laugh because then I see everyone else as somehow against me or somehow different and myself as not belonging at all. So I want to get on to how we practice, but I wanted to you know, just make that link between letting go and love giving, giving to ourselves, giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, giving ourselves patience, time, etc., etc. Actually, the fourth uh, one of letting go, so it's chaga, patanistika, muti, and analia. Analia means like we don't let things stick. So again, that could be related to praise or blame, yeah? what the Buddha called two of the worldly winds, praise and blame come and go, and if we define ourselves by them, we're going to be very confused. Because out of everyone in this hall, I mean, you don't know each other very well, but you all are looking at me, and there'll be at least 41, I think there's 41 of you, so there'll be at least 41 different perceptions at any given time, and now there'll be another 41, and now there'll be another 41, right? So if I'm chasing those to define myself, that is big suffering indeed. <laughs> so, meta for ourselves and how we practice. So, in this retreat, I am basically basing the method around um, what's taught in the Visuddhi Magga. And this is one of the commentarial texts that was written, huh, and I knew I would forget the time exactly. I think it might be about um, 200, 200 years after the Buddha. Anybody know the time of the Visuddhi Magga? I forget. It's quite an old commentary, but not that old. Did you? Did anyone know? No. Okay, you can check that out later. Um, but in the early Buddhist teachings, it's actually quite different. It talks more about metta as um, spatial expansion in the four different directions. So it's not actually directing metta to particular types of human being or being. <clears throat> it's more concerned with the expansiveness of metta. And there's a lovely simile which likens it to somebody who um, goes up to the top of a mountain and blows a trumpet, and the noise of that trumpet can be heard in every direction, equally. And in the same way, we're, we're encouraged to generate metta in that way. And I wanted to read the Buddha's own words on this, because it's really beautiful. And here he's using the language of monastics, but I'll use the word um, person instead, to be more inclusive. <coughs> So it says, here a person dwells, pervading one quarter, with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and in every way, one dwells, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. So you can see this is a very lofty ideal in a way. And um, it suggests a certain evenness. 
Another phrase that's often used in the suttas is, to all as to myself. Yeah. So we spread it to all beings just in the same way that we would spread it to ourselves. And that can be the opposite. We have it to ourselves just as we would have it to a loved person. Because we are the dearest person to us. We will protect our life at any cost. <coughs> but so that it becomes easier, the uh, technique in the Siddhi Magga developed to go stage by stage. And I think this is very effective because it's incremental and gradual. It's a certain logical sequence that starts with an easier person and builds up to the more difficult. And one of the advantages of this is that there's no kind of nook or cranny in the heart, ideally, that remains unseen. You know, it can be easy when we're in a beautiful state of mind, maybe not that easy, but it can be possible when all's well to just have this generalized sense of loving kindness to all beings. But what happens after that when you're feeling great, you go home and someone at home just criticizes you straight away. <laughs> you haven't done the dishes or what about all this work? I've been suffering while you've been on retreat, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. And then how do you respond? Because at that moment, this person actually falls into the difficult category. And unless you've actually worked with the difficult category, which involves working with your own tendency to irritation, anger, ill will, you know, agitation, then the metta is going to subside pretty fast and it can even completely turn <laughs> into hate. <laughs> Hopefully not direct hate, but you know, it can be easy to snap. So I think going stage by stage is really beautiful, it's really thorough, and it's like building a fire, yeah? So you can almost see um, these people as the fuel for the metta. And also the words, we use directed thought as another way to kind of direct the mind towards the meaning of loving kindness again and again. And also it accomplishes the function of removing distracting thoughts, yeah, quite easily. Not with force, so don't just, you know, continue to repeat it if your mind is all over the place. Allow the mind to settle first with some kindfulness, with getting embodied, letting things settle, noticing the silence developing a good relationship with that. And then when you can connect with the meaning of what you're doing and rouse the enthusiasm, the chanda, for the practice, then you can start to build the fire. And the first person, oneself or a loved person, um, is the easiest person to start with. So they are like the kind of, uh, what do you call that stuff? Kindling for the fire. Like the really little bits of paper and... Uh, maybe some fire lighters and, you know, bits of dry twig. So you start the fire that way. And only after it's been burning for some time, and different teachers will suggest different things here, you can keep it burning like that for the entire retreat, and I think that's totally fine. Um, because you will be resourcing your mind to then move to other people in due course. And you may find that a lot of ill will subsides anyway, and when you do face a difficult person, your mind is bigger, it's greater, it's more expansive to include um, the negative or the difficult as well. Um, but if we are going to go sequentially, we then put on another person, onto the, not onto the fire, but into our heart, which is a warm, <laughs> lovely place. <laughs> Don't even think about <laughs> anyone you'd like to put on the fire. <laughs> So we, we, we use the next person, which can be the benefactor or the loved person. Sometimes it's one and the same, you know. A benefactor is somebody who basically has your well-being at heart and perhaps who has provided for you in some way. I mean, my teacher is the obvious benefactor. Um, but also it can be that the better we know someone, the harder it is because we sometimes start to go into stories about our relationship with them and all the expectations that we have, which is, you know, again, interesting to note. But um, sometimes it's better to choose someone that is just fairly dear to you. An example of that for me in my first extensive meta retreat, probably 12 or 14 years ago, was the person who sponsored my retreat. <laughs> I was a nun at that time. I've been a nun for 18 years. And at that time, I didn't have a base. I was between Burma and Australia, stuck for a couple of years in Europe without anywhere to go. 
so I was kind of going between monasteries, but I didn't have any money, so I just kind of wait for the next opportunity to come. And she um, discovered this retreat in Italy and said, I want to sponsor you, your flight and the cost of the retreat. And yeah, she was a friend. She was someone from the monastery that was training at that time, but she wasn't a close friend. She was someone I'd spent a few months with here and there. Uh, but it was so easy to choose her as the loved person. And I would just picture her face beaming at me and me beaming at her. And I just kept that going. And it really felt easier for me to practice with her because it felt like I was giving something back. And again, that connects with that intention of loving kindness as a kind of giving, a kind of letting go. It's the practice of chaga, you're giving. And for me, that's a very beautiful perception. So I don't have my own benefit in the front of my mind. That will be there. But if I'm just meditating for myself, it's like, well, today I feel like it, tomorrow I don't. But if I'm meditating for someone else, it gives me a lot of motivation. So this was really powerful, and I used the benefactor, my teacher in Burma, from time to time when I, when I felt it needed a bit of supercharging, like I said last night. And then when we have um, developed the loving-kindness towards a loved person for some time, and it's quite solid, so I would suggest at least the first couple of days, like the next day, actually today and tomorrow, working with ourselves and the loved person, and you can continue to have those as your main people throughout the retreat. And just from time to time, we might move on to the next categories. And it will depend on each individual as to whether you want to experiment with that and how much. But the next one is really interesting because this is the so-called neutral person. And of course, nobody is neutral. What we mean is that our fe feelings for them are quite mild not particularly positive, not particularly negative. We don't maybe know them very well. We've never give them, given them a lot of thought or attention. Um, but they're just a human being like us, <clears throat> going about their business, going about their day. There's less investment with these people. We don't have any kind of um, investment for our happiness with them in the way we do with the loved. Sometimes it can be tricky with the loved because there is this wish for their happiness that's a little bit uh, attached and self-interested in a way, even if it's a good wish, right? But we really want them to be happy and if they're not, we get upset. But with a neutral person, there's less of a vested interest in their well-being or in any expectation we might have for them to provide for us. And so... In a sense, the love can be very pure once it starts, but it's also quite hard, and this is um, insightful, that it's quite hard to connect with them, precisely because they don't matter so much to us. So then we see how biased we are, you know, how, how our love is, uh, it favours some and excludes others, even by omission, not necessarily by intent, right? And even in the suttas, this was the case. Among the monks in the Buddha's day, there was a story about a, a sick monk. And he had all these terrible boils all over his body and dysentery as well. Probably had some type of horrible fever or maybe nowadays we'd say he had sepsis or something. And his boils were oozing and there was a terrible stench because no one was looking after him. And the Buddha got to know about this. And he called the monks. It was monks, not nuns. <laughs> I don't know if it happened in the nuns' quarters or not. Probably not. But, um, yeah, I'm just making the joke because all the stories in the suttas are about monks, nearly all the stories, and they're usually all the wonderful stories. But some of the stories... <laughs> so then I want to include the nuns. <laughs> anyway, in this particular story, um, the Buddha had to reprimand the monks, and he said, you know, why is nobody looking after this sick monk? And they were very honest. This is one of the features in the text. Generally, people are very honest and admit their faults. They said, well, he's never really done anything for us. You know? Do you know that kind of feeling? Well, what, what have they done for me? Why should I care? You know, he was kind of lazy or he kind of ignored us. We didn't really know him. He wasn't our friend. So they said, yeah, he never really did anything for us. And the Buddha said, um, the Buddha actually went by himself with his attendant to clean up the mess. And he tended to this sick monk with great loving care. 
and got him all the requirements he needed, the medicine he needed, cleaned him up, and, and really showed a beautiful example of loving kindness and compassion towards someone who maybe is neutral to others. And he said, um, one who would tend to the sick would tend to me. So he made this point that we have to tend to a sick person, even someone we despise, you know, who's maybe sitting in their own diarrhea in this case, in the way that we would tend to a, a revered and respected and beloved teacher. Can we do that? It's really a beautiful idea, right? Something that one of my first teachers told me, she was a Vipassana teacher in India, and I was serving there for some long retreats. And she said to me one day, the retreats were huge, they were like up to 500 people of women from all over the country and international as well. Illiterate people, people that had come through sponsorship just to get their chain fare there. Um, people with so many different languages, you had about 10 different discourses, translations playing at the same time. <laughs> We had Russian uh, yogis there as well, we had Jains, we had all kinds of people. Um, and she said to me, whenever you're serving, treat everybody as though they were a future stream winner. Because they could be. And a stream, win a stream winning is the first stage of enlightenment, so a stream winner is a noble person. You know, a person that's perfected right view, that has immense wisdom and loving kindness and an understanding of non-self so that their action really is for the benefit of all beings and is no longer self-centered and selfish in the way that someone who has yet to see non-self sometimes is. And I thought that was so lovely because the fact is we probably are all future stream winners. Anyone on the path is taking steps, right? And uh, I think it was the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi who said there's only two things you have to do in the practice. One is to start walking on the path, and the other one? To continue, yeah. Yeah. So as long as we've made a start, there's every chance we'll reach the end of the path, even if we go off course for a while. So this is a very beautiful perception that can help bring that sense of care and love and respect, even for the so-called neutral person or the person we don't have strong feelings about. And only then we... Um, might broach a difficult person. And as I said yesterday, it will not be your sworn enemy. It will not be somebody who has, whose behavior has resulted in lasting trauma or distress. You know, I've had an experience once with someone who was very close to me, who actually physically abused me out of the blue. Um, <laughs> through, and I knew it was based on unresolved trauma and things that happened in her past. But it was still very shocking to me. And she said to me, oh, we just have to send Meta. We just have to send Meta. And I rejected that because at that time, there was no acknowledgement of the devastation and trauma that that had caused for me. And to just think about this person would bring up such extreme distress that I wasn't in any fit state to practice Meta. So I realized that I had to leave that aside for the time being and just continue my metta practice as normal. And one time I was practicing metta for maybe 20 days or so on retreat. Maybe it was less than that, just to give you hope. I think it was about 10 days. And um, I'd been working with the loved person, my best friend from childhood, who was an example of unconditional love. And uh, the metta was really flowing. I felt the mind was bright and wide and expansive and beautiful and very resourced. And one day during the practice, this other person came to mind. Just the memory of her and her face and her presence. And it was like she just dropped into the flow, just so seamlessly, so effortlessly. It didn't create any um, disturbing emotional response. In fact, it just seemed that the flow was so great it swept her along too, it included. And then I realized, wow, again, metta has its own wisdom. There's a time for practicing with all types of people and sometimes it spontaneously happens like that. And ever since that time, I could actually think about her and not necessarily generate deliberate loving kindness, but now when I think about her and I talk about the situation, 
I'm okay. You know, there's not, it's not a trigger for that trauma anymore. And I'm sure that this is because the heart was wide. It had gone to greatness. It was Mahagata, as the Buddha said. It becomes like a big, wide lake. And even if you put a little bit of salt in that lake, it doesn't really alter the flavor. The lake is just too wide. Whereas when you put that little bit of salt in a glass of water, it becomes undrinkable, right? And this is a simile straight from the Buddhist text called the salt crystal, which I'll talk more about later. But it's very interesting. So the trick here is that we put on the right things on the fire at the right time. We start with the kindling, then we put on the like slightly uh, small logs, let's say, quite slim logs, and then later we might put big logs on the fire when it's really burning. And after a while, that's the neutral person, we might even be able to put a huge, big, sappy log that hasn't yet dried out. I saw some of these at my host's house. Um, there were big trees that had been felled for firewood, and I asked, and they would take a whole year to dry. So you wouldn't think to put them on the fire at that stage. But with metta, when the fire's really strong, you can actually put those kind of logs on, and they will take the heat, they will take the flame. They will ignite. <laughs> Once I was in um, Australia in uh, Santi Forest Monastery. It's on the, uh, the other side, we always say. <laughs> on the east coast, New South Wales, a long way from here. And uh, one of my other teachers, Sayadu Ujagara, was there. Uh, basically, he was there because we invited him to give us a retreat. So there were seven nuns and one teacher, and it was great. We had personal interviews, like often, as, as often as we wanted, and he just gave a talk once every few days. And uh, he was staying in a kuti in a little hut that had a kind of fireplace that was um, long, like oblong shaped, and very narrow actually. And he said, well, it's cold in there, how do I make a fire? And I said, well, you know, there's not a lot of air because it's so narrow, so you have to first of all put the kindling on, and then after that you put the... Uh, you know, you put the small logs in, and then you put the other logs, etc. So you just build it stage by stage. And then he came the next day, and this is just a funny story. It's not to, I think it's very funny, and I'm sure you would agree. But uh, he came the next day, he said, it was all full of smoke. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Why? What happened? He said, well, I did what you said, and I put the kindling, then I put the others, and then I lit it. <laughs> I said, oh, no, <laughs> you have to first light the kindling, <laughs> only later you put on the logs, so that was really funny. <laughs> but this is what we try and do, and sometimes yesterday as well, people were saying, can we send it to this person, can we send it to that, and that's a wonderful intention to be able to send it to everybody, but we need to go stage by stage, and not to snuff out the fire before it's even lit. So be careful of that wish to kind of start spreading it around or, you know, engaging with lots and lots of different people. Maybe one or two at the most for each category is sufficient because otherwise it can uh, feed our restlessness, you know. I have this too, I get enthusiastic and that enthusiasm, instead of going in, it starts to go out and I remember this person, this person, oh, they need some metta, they need some metta. But actually the purpose of the metta is to purify our mind, not to improve their life or make them happy. We will have more love, we will have less animosity the deeper we go, and we will be a source of love for all beings. We, without even trying, you know, we'll be able to come in contact with people and just have an automatic caring disposition. It becomes part of our character, we just care. You know, and when we can do that, even when somebody confronts us or when they're angry, then we know that we're developing the loving kindness in a very balanced way. And it takes time, of course. I mean, the Buddha's um, ultimate example is that even if you're being sawn apart, limb by limb, with a two-handled saw, if you have a thought of hatred towards those people, then you're not practicing loving kindness. Which is true at that moment. <laughs> right? But he was actually saying that that's the standard to aspire to. And I think... Rather than think, oh, that's too far away, that's impossible, my love is hopeless, it's not even love, just take that as um, a perspective on the little irritations we have to suffer in life. 
because they're really not that difficult, they're not that bad. You know, if somebody gets upset with us, well, maybe they've not slept well. Maybe they're in a bad mood, maybe their partner just told them they were leaving. We don't know what they're going through, right? I know that when I haven't slept well, or when I have too many demands on my time, I have a shorter fuse, you know. I don't tend to get angry, but I'm definitely not, you know, flowing with loving kindness and, you know, you can listen, I can listen to you all day. It's like, no, <laughs> I need some space, you know. So this is often the case with people who behave badly. They're just not resourced. So there was quite a bit more I wanted to say, but I'll have to go through it quickly. Uh, but I wanted to just, um, talk about the phrases themselves. We've already touched on it, so it will be brief. But um, to choose phrases that really relate to either yourself or the loved person. And it might be different between you and the loved person. Try and think what they would really wish for themselves, you know. Rather than may you be, I don't know, healthy. Maybe they'd rather may you be content. I don't know. We can have basic good wishes regarding their physical and mental well-being, but see if you can tune into them and find the right phrases for that person. We're not going to do this till later, by the way, but <laughs> that's an example. Uh, we'll continue with ourselves this morning. Um, and getting in touch with the meaning, yeah? This is really important, allowing that meaning to resonate in the heart, because every word has a power, it has an emotional charge, if you like. Like if you would just sit now for a moment with your eyes closed and bring up a word like, I'm gonna bring up some slightly less positive words just to see if you can tell the difference. Hopefully not too triggering or too difficult. So, safe. Confident. Just feeling it in your body. Love. Fear. Grounded. Maybe it's a little too quick, but words have energies about them. And this was shown through some uh, scientific experiments done, I think, mostly in Japan, on the qualities of water. And they would... Um, soak, for example, rice in water. And then they would speak to the different containers. They'd have like three different containers. It was really fascinating. Uh, and one container with the rice, they'd say love to it quite often. One they would actually say the word hate. And one they would ignore. And the one that received the word love started to ferment in quite a nice way. The one that received the word hate started to go black and kind of mouldy, not mouldy, kind of black, like off. And the one that was ignored went mouldy. Really interesting. I, I think there's, it's something like Water the Great Mystery, something like this. See if you can Google it, because it's an amazing film. And people who watched it said that they did their own experiments and found similar results. And we can feel, that's why I usually choose positive words, actually, in the phrases, rather than may you be free from danger. I rather use, may I be safe, right? May I be free from suffering. That's sometimes good for compassion, but for metta, it's better to say, may I be at peace. So I like to use words that have that positive connotation because that's what the subconscious mind will hear. And then how we say them is important as well. So with the phrases, we space them a certain way. You know, you can listen in the gap and elongate it or shorten it if your mind's uh, agitated. But also the tone of voice that we use can be soothing. You know, it can be clear, it can be um, rhythmic. 
So there's a certain rhythm to the words that is relaxing for the mind, that helps us to calm the mind. Sometimes we can also, if the metta is really flowing quite strongly and you're confident in that, you can drop the words down, you can drop the phrase from may I be happy, just to happy. May I be peaceful, peaceful. Don't do it too soon because these words are like your kind of foundation of the practice. It's like a substitution in a way for the breath. You know, when we do breath meditation, we have that object there all the time. So don't drop them too quickly. But if the feeling of metta does start to grow quite strongly in a reliable way, say it's been there for 20 minutes and it's still there, you can experiment with either um, making the gap longer between the phrases or just dropping down to a word. And as I said, one of my teachers only uses, may I be happy, that's all he ever uses. So it could also be a single phrase. But again, don't be too quick and don't chop and change too easily because that again can free the restless mind. Maybe I'm saying this because my main hindrance tends to be restlessness. Um, but you can experiment for yourself. And then about the feelings associated with that metta. It's important to keep them embodied to make sure that you're feeling them somewhere in the body, in the region of the heart or wherever it is. And again, you might start to feel that your mind expands and you start to feel that feeling everywhere to the degree that it doesn't really matter where that feeling is arising. You don't have to physically locate it, but it is soaking through the body. It is definitely embodied. And as the mind and the feeling grows, the mind grows in power, the feeling grows in, in strength and in purity as well, then it will become increasingly um, mental in a way, as in not mental as in mad, <laughs> hopefully, but um, increasingly produced by the mind because actually it is the purity of the mind that's starting to manifest as pleasant sensations in the body. It's not actually caused by the body. It's just reflected on the body as an aspect of your mind. It's a sign that the mind is becoming still, it's becoming um, bright, it's becoming um, loving and pure. So over time the body might start to fade into the background as the feeling of metta, the um, emotional or mental aspect of that loving kindness takes over. And this is when we can start to move into um, deeper samadhi. So maybe, just in case anyone's having this already, but at this time, sometimes metta might be experienced as a nimitta, which can usually be a feeling nimitta, which really just means a sign that uh, the metta is starting to become more stable, more, um, more reliable, and there's a sense of steadiness about that feeling tone. And you can increasingly kind of let go into that feeling. So nimitta just means sign. It's a sign that the metta is starting to become strong, become powerful. And some other people might experience that as, say, uh, a visual impression. It might appear like kind of cotton wool or it might appear like a glow around a candle flame, something like this. But the, it doesn't really matter because people's minds are different and it will appear differently every time. But the main thing you want to stay connected to is the, um, the pleasure of it, the softness or the brightness or the lightness and connecting that with the wish of metta. Don't just drift completely with it yet. You know, the phrases might still be needed from time to time. But at some point the mind will become so strong that in my teacher's words, it can kidnap the will. <laughs> and that's really beautiful. I heard him say that just the other day in a meta talk that I hadn't heard for a long time. He said, the mind can take over and become so powerful, the meta becomes so intense that it kidnaps your will and you're not even able to repeat the words. So this may or may not happen, but I'm just sketching a little bit more of the territory. Um, but the main thing is to really soak in this feeling and protect it. When it arises, don't just throw it away too easily. Don't just open your eyes, bang, I'm looking all around and you're thinking about the next thing. Stay inside, stay as though you have like a very 
tender. Maybe you have like a little bird just here or something that you're holding, just mentally with your mind, or, or a treasure, a gem, something very fragile that you, you want to protect with your gentle awareness. So don't let it go too quickly. And my goodness, I'm already out of time. But uh, very quickly, I will just say that uh, this whole thing is a process. It's a process of making good karma in the beginning, making good mental karma by having wholesome thoughts, wholesome intentions. And over time, that wholesome intention, that wholesome way of using the mind manifests as a feeling. First of all, we start to see the mind settle. And when the mind settles, we can see some of the dregs at the bottom of the lake. We can see the kind of resentments, the fears, the kind of irritations we have with our hobby or our wife or whoever it might be. On a mental retreat I was teaching in Devon, one of the women said, oh, it's amazing, you know, I have a great relationship with my husband, but sometimes he irritates me, and his face came up like a gargoyle <laughs> in my meditation. <laughs> and it made her laugh, you know, but it also made her realise there were some kind of lingering resentments. And uh, she said, oh, I'll talk to him about it when I go home, because he'll understand. Um, so we can have humour around it as well. Sometimes humour is not a bad thing to do. And um, after a while, you know, when, those, uh, when we see those dregs, those kind of lingering resentments, and we work with them patiently and uh, skillfully, then that lake starts to become very pure, and it starts to expand. The mind starts to expand and include um, more of life, more of life, and gradually more different categories of being as well. So the, the love really does start to widen. So this is one of the goals of metta. Metta is that boundless, expansive love that includes everyone and everything, and even every mental state. So I think that is enough. And uh, I just wish you um, enjoyable practice with patience and gentleness, letting this practice ripen and develop in its own time.